Welcome to Backstage with Jeffrey Morrissey. I am your host, Jeffrey Morrissey. I am beyond honored to be at the Royale and to be joined by Hamilton Lighthouser. Hamilton, how are you today? I'm doing great. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, My I don't, pleasure. I'm not sure if you realize this. You are a part of Boston music history because you actually ended up playing the first ever iteration of Boston Calling, which is our city's sort of hallmark music festival now. Uh, so do you remember how you got involved with that show? Or do you remember any details about it? Um, I think that show is booked by some guys in the national yeah aaron and bryce i think yeah yeah and they're old friends of ours so i think they probably invited us sweet sweet it was a uh, i think the set is uh, somewhere on youtube and it definitely was a good one yeah that was fun i have a much longer history with boston though because i used to live here oh really and i started my first serious band here Oh, Very, nice. way too serious, actually, the music. <laughs> way too serious. Yeah, definitely. We thought we were pretty badass. Is the music still lying around somewhere? Is it um, yeah, we were it? called The Recoys. It's on, um, It's on. you know, whatever, Spotify. Really? Okay, nice, nice. I'll definitely have to check it out. What brought you to Boston? Did you go to school here? Uh, I did, yeah. Okay. I went to school here for just a couple of years. Nice. And is there anything that you now have to do whenever you're back in Boston to uh, celebrate? Um, I used to, but no, that was so long ago. I've, <laughs> I've you know... The days of nostalgia are kind of behind me now. Well, that must be a, a freeing feeling, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading this really interesting qu uh, quote from you, and it was, I don't try to recreate uh, my records identically live because that's not really that fun, which I agree with. Uh, so what do you try and change up, and how do you keep sort of touring and, and road life and live shows fun and interesting and engaging for you and the audience? Well, bringing in new people always is the biggest change. A new instrument or a new person. Mm -hmm. um, I hired a new guitar player for this tour, so I have two now. Mm -hmm. um, I have Courtney Marie Andrews come up and join me on stage every night, and she has this great voice. And um, try to bring in new songs. But e even if you don't have that many new songs, if you get new people in there, it'll start shaking it up. And that's always like the way to keep it fun. Well, nice, nice. And, and uh, also what helps is when you have new music. Uh, Heartstruck, Wild Hunger is your uh, latest single with Angel Olsen, and we'll get to the collaboration with her in a minute. But I was reading the lyrics, and they just struck me as so incredibly poetic, which most of your lyrics oh, do. Thanks. But it, but it uh, almost seemed like you wrote the lyrics first, and I know that that's not your typical style. So. For that song? Yeah. Um, I wrote most of the lyrics pretty quickly I guess as I wrote the music they kind of went at the same time mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the end that song took so long to finish that um, I was right in the end it was like over a period of two and a half maybe three years really yeah it's funny it doesn't sound like it no, so I wish doesn't. I could say I dashed it off on like a cocktail napkin but <laughs> in the end I really put in like endless man hours and how do you sort of leave a song, come back to it with the same passion and add to it? Because I I mean, over three years, I mean, the meaning must evolve over those three years. Yeah, I mean, I put it away. I, mm. I, 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 it was something I started as just a demo. I started just like a big batch of songs, I guess right after I finished my record Black Hours. Mm -hmm. And I got maybe halfway through that song and I really liked it, but I couldn't finish it. And I put it away for a couple of years and maybe I got it out one time, but then... Then recently I got it out again and I realized that what I really needed was to make it a duet mm -hmm. and I needed to re-record all my drums. And I, I did, I, the, I, I knew I wanted, I re-sang it and I wanted it to be really, have a lot of energy in the vocals. And the first person I thought of was Angel Olsen, who I wanted to do it. And luckily, um, she wanted to, so. Well, she's a perfect fit, a beautiful voice for sure. Um, but you've had the ability to do some amazing collaborations. Angel, Rostam, obviously. So what do you look for in a collaborator where you know it's it's something that you want to try and you know that the process is going to go well? Well, if I just like a substantial amount of the person's stuff, then I'm, I'm willing to trust them to make decisions and bring in ideas that maybe you're not only going to not have thought of yourself, but you maybe don't feel totally comfortable about it first mm -hmm. and uh that is what is uh that's the best part of working with someone else when you can know you know with someone like rostam i'd be like you know he'd suggest something that was just so out of left field yeah and to the point where not, not just surprising but also like uneasy and you're thinking well i don't i don't know if i like i'm not i don't know if i'm even interested in this mm -hmm. but you know he'll sort of ram it home and then you think well, I do, you know, like a lot of the stuff this guy's been a part of over the years. 
So I'll give it a chance. And then that ended up, you know, and I think he, the same thing, it went both ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we got to our sound. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I feel so, I think is so interesting about the Rostam collaboration specifically is that he was such a fan of you and your work. And a lot of times you could sort of look back and hear the way that, that you influence other bands, but you get to, now you're in a position where you can actually work with someone who you have influenced. So was that a first for you? Did, did that add sort of like a- It's funny being dynamic? the old guy. I was always the, in the Walkman, I'm like four years younger than most of the guys. Oh, okay. Um, so it is funny when the tables turn mm -hmm. and like Rostam's asking me sort of questions about like ancient history and stuff because he was like a little kid when I was, when we had our first kind of success and like, it, that, that is, that's a funny moment, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and then the other thing is, I mean, the intersection of the fan bases for those two old bands, Vampire Weekend and um, The Walkman, did you notice that you were sort of attracting a younger demographic? or the, With those, the new record? With the new record, yeah. I don't know. Is it younger? I guess it is, yeah. A I, mean, I would say probably 10, maybe 10 years yeah. difference. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I hadn't thought about it too much, mm -hmm. to be honest. I don't know. I'll take a look at the crowd tonight. <laughs> I mean, the shows are still selling out anyway. So, I mean, that, that's I didn't that's sell out tonight. Sign. I'll tell you that much. Uh, well, For some reason, Boston just not, not ticket sales are not very great in Boston tonight. Well, my apologies for that. I wish our, our city could show up. I don't know why. Maybe if the recoys get back together yeah, and right? you guys That's do a couple need. songs, right? There yep. we go. There we go. Um, but I was at the show the last time that uh, you were there, and you had the amazing Lucy Dacus out on tour with you. Oh, too. right. That was at the Sinclair? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was fun. That was a very, very good show. Um, and then so one of the narratives of the record, um, I Had a Dream That You Were Mine, uh, is that people are always saying it's influenced by you know such older stuff, and it, I just always find it funny how narratives form around records. So for you, how do you walk the line between being influenced by something, not copying it, and taking it and making your own and remaining original? Well, which you do tough. on this record. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's hard. That's what I spend all my time trying to do just that. So, uh, how I, I, I don't know if I can say how I can like think about the way you, you just hear yourself play something, and sometimes it feels like you've made it your own because of just the way you're playing the guitar, and that's how you play it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just you're not that you're not so great on the guitar, and it's not it's really just you know somebody else could do it better or, or you're just imitating someone else I, I try to pick up new instruments and you try to find different ways to record them and different order of writing parts for songs and sometimes you try to write the drums first or try, sometimes you just try to figure out what the most exciting little bit is and then try to strip away as much else as you possibly can um, it's 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 not easy it's 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 pretty hard uh, and again, uh, I had a dream that you were mine uh, a thousand times is the sort of um, that's where the line comes from. So I have to ask, do you have you ever had a recurring dream or some dream that is sort of comes to you so often that it's a uh, it sort of becomes a motif? When I was little, I had this um, someone I know had a Norwegian kitchen witch in their w kitchen. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, it scared me so much that I had this reoccurring dream for like five years in my life that a kitchen witch was coming after me. Really? Yeah, I really was like, I had it until I was like probably 12 or 13. Well, that doesn't sound too fun at all. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe a song about it for uh, for the next record. The, yeah. the Return of the Kitchen Witch or something <laughs> like that. Uh, and then the album closes with arguably my favorite song on the record, 1959. Um, if you were to have to write a song about 2017 and title it 2017, what would that song look like for you? Oh, man. It would have to be pretty dark, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Troubling. <laughs> chaotic. I don't know. Too, it would have to just be fast paced. One of those like, be kind of like Skrillex or something. Yeah. About a million sounds in one three minute thing. Maybe that'll be the next collaboration, you and Skrillex. Right. I'm yeah. Looking forward to the record already. Um, and then, so I know that you're working on new music right now. You'll have a new album out uh, somewhat soon. As you start to make that record, and as you've had time to to sort of reflect over your time in music, what would you say is your musical Achilles heel, or the thing that you are always constantly trying to improve, or the thing that you always sort of walk away with mixed feelings about? Um, I I think it's it's funny having uh, I've always been the singer. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that maybe the my sort of s strongest songwriting stuff is in the vocals and the melodies. And so, um, coming back, always coming back to that role can be uh, sort of feel a little confining when you would rather be 
the drummer or the uh, you know you want to play the bass or you want to play the guitars and you 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 can get excited about the musical ideas but always having to come back and be the front man mm -hmm. has can take its toll I mean it, it, I mean I'm sure everybody feels that way about their role but but I've never been anything but the guy in the front and um, and sometimes it just seems like it would be nice to maybe have another just stand yeah behind, behind someone else a little bit. Well, I mean, that's what super groups are for. I mean, you right. can always try something like that. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, but um, it, so y your words, you said that you were the, the old guy in the collaboration. Uh, you've been doing this for quite some time. Um, do you wish that you sort of like w when your first bands like the Recoys were forming, do you wish that you guys started in 2017 with Spotify, social media, all that stuff? Or are you happy that you were able to come up in a time without sort of all that added noise? I'm very glad that we were able to do it the old way i mean it, it, to me now you're just i i it, it, you get so lost and and in the internet i do at least i mean maybe i would be more adapted to it someone like rustin is much more adapted to that than i am but mm -hmm. but i don't know if it would I, I to me it would seem like it would make it so much harder to make a real connection with anybody as a new presence i was already like an established presence by the time napster and all that stuff really took off and and mm -hmm. the, the internet really took over um, I would think now to like to connect with people and then hold the connection would be it's just so much more impersonal. There's no the internet like a, a tweet or like an MP3 is just like a flash and it's gone and and I don't I mean I like when new bands come along now and I find myself really liking them like even if I really like them I don't ever I never have the connection I did when I was younger where I just love them and I went I met. I was introduced to them at a show or like I had a record, a, a vinyl record and I, you know, played it by myself at home and I like built up a real love for this band. I, I don't find myself liking anything as much as I did back then. And I think it's just because I can just click to the next thing. Well, the connection is so much more personal. Like even that, if you put on a record, it's you at home in a room doing that. If you put it on Spotify, you literally see the number of other people listening yeah, to that at exactly. the exact same time. Right, which is, they just shouldn't do that. It's just, yeah, I, I, there's a lot that I don't love about it. Well, I, I tend to agree with you. And uh, you do so many of these interviews, which as a journalist, I'm appreciative of. What do you wish that we would ask you more often that you had a chance to talk about a little bit more in these mm. conversations? Uh -huh. I don't know if I have anything else. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing that stands out, to be perfectly honest. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, this will be my last question for you. Who are you listening to right now? Who are the artists that have your ear? Uh, let's see. I, I like this band, Car Seat Headrest. Oh, of course. They're amazing. Who I think are, they're pretty funny. Um, I like... Uh, today we were listening to something I sort of liked. Um, I had never heard before called... Um, what was it called? It was this girl... She used to be in some band called The Knife, mm -hmm. and now she has this new band, Fever something. Oh, wait, no, Ray, something Ray. Fever Ray, maybe? Fever Ray, okay. Yeah, maybe that's the name of it. And uh, I've been listening to a lot of ambient music, actually, on this tour, because my guys all listen to a lot. We listen to Brian Eno's Apollo, and I was listening to this girl, Juliana Barwick. Oh, okay. Her. Um, so we've had a lot of new stuff around in the van recently, which has been kind of fun, actually, catching up on all the new stuff. Well, nice. If you're looking for new stuff, check out the single Heartstruck Wild Hunger. It's Hamilton and Angel Olsen. And then also uh, Hamilton and Rostam, I Had a Dream That You Were Mine. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the time. Thank today, you. The pleasure is all mine.